Welcome to the Surgery 101 video of intestinal malrotation. The content of this video was advised by Dr. Iona Brachu, a pediatric surgeon here at University of Alberta. My name is Jennifer Hu, and I am a fourth year med student from McGill University. We are talking about intestinal malrotation because it is an important condition that can present in a variety of ways. An early diagnosis of the condition can prompt early management which can have a big impact on the prognosis of the condition. The incidence of malrotation has been estimated at 1 in 6,000 live births. Associated anomalies may occur. The ones with the highest incidence include gastroschisis, onphalocele, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, intestinal atresia, cardiac anomalies, especially heterotaxy syndrome with polysplenia, and trisomy 21. After watching this video, you should be able to understand the embryology behind malrotation, explain the clinical presentation and management, and appreciate the subtleties in the clinical presentation of older patients. Let's start with a case. When you're on call during your rotation in pediatric surgery, the ER pages you and informs you about a transfer from another hospital of a 20-day-old newborn, Sunny, presenting with projectile bilious vomiting being transferred to your hospital to roll out malrotation. They will page back when the patient arrives. Before Sunny's arrival, you quickly read up about malrotation to remind yourself of some key points. In fact, normal rotation of the intestine requires transformation from a simple straight alimentary tube into the mature fixed and folded configuration normally present at birth. But how does development occur exactly? The development of the midgut begins with the differentiation of the primitive intestinal tract into the foregut, midgut, and hindgut at the fourth week of gestation. The mature alimentary tract and all associated digestive organs are formed from this primitive tube. The most accepted model of midgut maturation involves four distinct stages. 1. Herniation 2. Rotation 3. Retraction and 4. Fixation. At the end of normal rotation, the colon forms a frame, much like a picture frame, with the ligament of trites fixed just to the left of the vertebral body at the level of the pylorus, and small bowel in the middle of the frame, with the appendix on the right side of the abdomen as the cecum is fixed there. In malrotation, this orientation does not happen. There is no ligament of trites fixation, and there is no real fixation of the cecum. Everything is loosey-goosey, and the bowel can easily twist around its base, essentially strangling itself at the root of the mesentery that includes the entire superior mesenteric artery territory. This twist, or volvulus, can happen especially if the mobile duodenum is sticky to the mobile cecum by adhesions we call lats bands. Sunny arrives to the ER, and you open up the chart that was started from the hospital she was at before. From the look of it, it sounds like she is a previously healthy term newborn who had a sudden onset of bilious vomiting for the past 12 hours, which is the cardinal sign of neonatal intestinal obstruction, and malrotation with volvulus must be the presumed diagnosis until proven otherwise. Up to 75% of patients present during the first month of life, while another 15% will be presenting within the first year. You proceed on with your physical exam, which is unremarkable other than a mildly distended upper abdomen. This reassures you, as the abdomen can become more distended and tender, the vascular compromise to the completely obstructed bowel develops. Later, you would also be able to observe abdominal wall erythema and shock. Sunny has already had some imaging done for her, and her plain anterior posterior abdominal film combined with the lateral decubitus, shows gastric distension. Your team decides to send Sunny for a water-soluble upper GI contrast study as it is the gold standard, and you find evidence of a duodenum that does not sweep to the left, and rather, it remains on the right side of the abdomen with a corkscrew appearance of the proximal intestines, suggesting malrotation with volvulus. Alright, so you have officially diagnosed Sunny with malrotation and volvulus as a cause of her bilious emesis. How are you going to manage her? Preoperatively, we pay attention to the ABCs, 
and we would be resuscitating them with IV fluids, inserting a nasogastric tube for decompression, and giving them broad-spectrum antibiotics. The pediatric surgeon arrives shortly after to take Sunny to the OR for immediate exploration, and you get to scrub in. You learn in the OR that there are two main approaches to OR repair. The first approach is open, and was initially described by Dr. William Edwards Ladd. The steps involve detorsion of bowel in acute cases, division of lats bands, which is just a fancy way of saying lysis of adhesions, broadening of the small intestines mesentery, performing an appendectomy, and then subsequent placing of small bowel along the right lateral gutter and colon along the left lateral gutter. I wanted to make a small mention for a subset of patients who will present less dramatically with chronic intermittent obstruction. They will also have non-specific presenting problems such as failure to thrive, gastroesophageal reflux, early satiety, and mild abdominal discomfort. They may have been labeled in the past as suffering from abdominal migraines, and this is where we need to be very careful. We need to prove that the anatomy is normal by doing a quick and easy test, the upper GI contrast study. This will help us rule out malrotation. Patients who are found to have symptoms from rotational anomalies should undergo operative intervention, and the general recommendation in the asymptomatic older patient is to discuss the option of careful watching as they are asymptomatic or performing a laparoscopic LAS procedure. In summary, here are the following takeaway points. 1. Rotational anomalies occur as a result of an arrest of normal rotation of the embryonic gut. They can be associated with other abnormalities, but also occur in otherwise healthy children. 2. Vomiting, which is usually bilious, so green-like, much like a forest green, is the most common presenting symptom of malrotation in infancy. It is often accompanied by abdominal distension and tenderness. Peritonitis, shock, and or hematochesia represent signs of bowel ischemia in patients with volvulus. 3. The presentation of intestinal malrotation in older children is variable and often insidious. These patients may also present with acute onset of bilious vomiting and obstruction due to midgut volvulus. However, they more often have intermittent vomiting or abdominal pain. 4. A very simple and easy test to rule out malrotation is the water-soluble upper GI contrast study. 5. Marotation with volvulus, regardless of the age of the patient and the presence of symptoms, is treated surgically with a LAT procedure. And finally, 6. Dealing with a patient who has a symptomatic malrotation as an incidental finding is still debated. Observation is valid, but many would also consider a laparoscopic LAS procedure.